Neural anatomy and function. Neurons have a soma or cell body with many dendrites that collect information. Impulses are transmitted down the axon, which is wrapped by a myelin sheath separated by nodes of Ranvier. Integration happens in the soma. And this is a spike initiation zone right here called the axon hillock. It's a region of the soma that's rich in sodium channels, which makes it easier to meet threshold and for a spike to initiate down the axon. If that happens, the signal's rapidly conducted to the axon terminal where transmitters are secreted to the next axon across the synapse. That's the structure of a motor neuron, but there are many different types of neurons and their morphology reflects their function. Some neurons are primarily soma with many dendrites. Those neurons are involved in signal integration. Bipolar cells communicate information between different groups of neurons um, and are common in the retina, for example. Motor in neurons integrate information in the soma, but then when they fire, transmit their signals a long way to their motor targets. So they have long axons. And especially in the mammalian brain, neurons can have a great number of dendrites for integration. And here's a, a, a cell from the thalamus. Real neurons have a complex anatomy, but you can see elements of all of the things that we just talked about. Throughout the evolution of animals, we see a trend of increasing complexity. From nerve nets that have diffuse organization and are primarily involved in integration to the directional specialization to the formation of ganglia. We see clusters of nerve cell bodies condensing. And then we have this repetition across all segments. Um, this segmental organization is something that happened early in both invertebrates and vertebrates. And we have in insects, for example, and um, crustaceans, condensation and specialization of the body segments. So we generally have a head region, um, a thoracic region, and an abdominal region. We see remarkable similarities between invertebrates and vertebrates. They have nerve cords which evolve mostly independently. So there's segmentation, condensation, and specialization among body segments and integration along the nerve cord. However, the invertebrate nerve cord is located ventrally, whereas the vertebrate is dorsally located. Even though our segments have evolved, our brain and spinal nerves still retain segmental organization. The vertebrate body plan is developmentally segmented into regions, and each segment has its own vertebra and spinal nerve. So humans have eight cervical segments, 12 thoracic segments, five lumbar segments, um, and then we have the hip here and the sacral segments, of which there are four. So this is the basic plan across vertebrates, but we have plus or minus different numbers of segments depending on the species. And you can see that organization across the myotomes as well. Um, there are muscle regions that correspond with each of these spinal nerves. So why can't Tim Tam walk? Just a few months ago, he could. It's maddening. His hind limbs got weaker, COVID-19 hit, and all of his muscle mass wasted away. Because his lameness is bilateral, meaning on both sides, the vet suspected neurological issues. Um, degenerative myelopathy is what they proposed at first, which is basically um, a disease of the spinal cord that eventually results in total paralysis like ALS. Um, but it's a rare disease and his tail is just fine. You know, this is a disease that affects the entire body, um, starting from the caudal end working forward.
But for Tim Tam, everything before and after the hind limbs works. So we started doing EMS, electrical muscle stimulation. <laughs> and we got his thighs bulked up again. But his lower limb is still very slight and he doesn't still have control of his feet. So one clue about, oh, but you can see here that he still has his spinal reflexes, which is really interesting. So one clue may be in that segmental organization. It turns out that spinal nerves L4 through L6 innervate the thigh, but L7 and S1 See, you can see here, here's L, the, the field for L1, L2, L3, L4, um, L5. But you see here, L6 goes down the lower leg, L7 goes down the lower leg, and S1, it's the back of the thigh. Um, and it's known that um, L7, S1 in that region, uh, well, maybe L6 as well, give rise to the sciatic nerve, which innervates the lower limb, the feet, and the back of the thigh, the most caudal segment of the limbs. There's some variation though, and um, because the spinal nerves form nerve plexuses, so there's individual to individual variation. But in dogs, and especially German shepherds, they get something called degenerative lumbosacral stenosis which can be a collapse of the L7-S1 intervertebral space or arthritis or a misalignment, as you can see here in this x-ray. This is not Tim Tam, this is a different dog. Um, bone defects or disruption of the blood supply. The upshot is a nerve disease affecting L7-S1, which could make a lot of sense for Tim Tam because those are the regions that are affected the most and least responsive. So you can see here, here's the plexus um, between L7, S1, 2, and 3, and the sciatic nerve here. So you can see how it's possible if these are healthy to have normal thigh function, but if there's some blockage or lesion here, that it would affect the lower limb. So you can see that, um, that the, the segmental organization here. Luckily, S2 and S3 are not too much affected, which would result in incontinence. Vertebrates have motor reflexes, so um, they handle motor reflexes in these spinal reflex arcs in the spinal column. So when you go to the doctor and they tap your knee or the vet taps your dog's knee, the receptor sends a signal along the afferent or sensory neuron to the dorsal root of the spinal nerve, where there's a little interneuron that synapses with the motor neuron, or the efferent, which sends a signal to the muscle to jerk, to kick, the, to contract. A signal is also sent upward to the brain, to the thalamus, where it synapses with the sensory area of the cortex and then it synapses via an interneuron to the motor area of the cortex. The cortex is the part of the brain that does a lot of integration and processing. And then the motor output is sent down the efferent back to the spinal column and eventually the, the muscle. So the brain will be aware of the sensation and can modulate the reaction, but reflex arcs allow really quick responses. For example, when you step on a sharp rock or something and retract your foot almost before you're even aware of it. That is thanks to your motor reflex. You can see here um, some of the nerve tracks on the leg here. So you can see that an important part of diagnosis of lameness is testing various reflexes to see if the spinal reflexes are intact and which ones are affected. And also to test for spinal lesions. So in some important terms for function. Afferent or to carry information from the sensory receptors to the brain or spinal cord. 
efferent or to carry away the motor instructions from the brain spinal cord to the muscles and glands, the effector organs. Interneurons conduct information among neurons within the CNS and act to integrate between neurons. Neurosecretory are those neurons that receive stimuli and secrete hormones and neurotransmitters into the blood. Let's talk a little bit about graded potentials and action potentials. Neurons are excitable cells and we can record their activity with a recording electrode like this and a stimulating electrode to inject or remove current. We can then measure the response in voltage and see what the voltage change is happening inside the cell. Remember the resting potential, resting membrane potential is negative. If we apply a small stimulus, a small current, we'll see a small depolarization, which is a small change in membrane potential. With a larger stimulus, we'll get a larger depolarization. If we apply a negative current, we'll get a hyperpolarization. All of these graded potentials are electrotonic and passive because they decay, and they're graded because they vary with magnitude of the stimulus. So the larger the stimulus, the larger the electrotonic potential or graded potential, same thing. But it also means that the potential decays with time and distance. It's not self-perpetuating like an action potential. On the other hand, action potentials are only triggered if the membrane potential crosses threshold. When that occurs, we get an active spike that does not decay with time or distance. It's self-perpetuating. So action potentials are said to be all or none. If they cross the threshold, we get an action potential. If they don't, we don't. These were figured out in experiments on giant axons in squid. Invertebrates do not have myelinated neurons, so their neurons are gigantic. These allowed for the first studies of signal propagation. Hodgkin and Huxley used voltage clamping to hold the membrane potential constant so that they could measure changes in membrane conductance during the action potential. Voltage clamping allows the experimenter to change membrane potential abruptly to any value they choose and hold it there using a feedback circuit. Ohm's law is V equals IR. Voltage equals current times resistance. Put another way, current is voltage times conductance, which is the reciprocal of resistance. Conductance, remember, is proportional to permeability. So how free are the ions to flow in or out of the cell? Here, our membrane potential is the membrane voltage minus the ENA, or where ENA is the chemical potential for the ion to cross the membrane. Um, it's set by the concentration gradient of the ion. Since the membrane voltage is being held constant experimentally, measuring the current allows us to determine the electromotive force, that is the V the membrane voltage minus the ENA. We can then use Ohm's law to calculate changes in membrane conductance during the action potential. So when GNA goes up, I goes up. And here's the experimental setup. This electrode here is actually passing current into the cell through a feedback loop to hold VM or membrane potential constant. And then we're recording using the el recording electrode to measure the ion current or G um, to measure changes in membrane permeability. It was brilliant. These early voltage clamping experiments 
led to the hypothesis that a sudden depolarization is what was causing a large number of sodium ion channels to open transiently. Okay, so here we have the depolarization. It flips polar polarity on the membrane, causing these membrane channels to open, which allows a flood of sodium into the axon because it's sodium is high outside and low inside. That's producing increase in sodium conductance across the membrane because these ions are actually, the charge is moving through. And as you recall, the current is the flow of charged particles. So as these positive ions are moving through, you have electricity. So we have, this is the GNA, the rising conductance or GNA causes the current INA to rise. So in order for this whole system to work, it's important that the voltage sensitive gates are only open transiently. And we'll see why in a little bit, but here's what happens molecularly. And this, this voltage sensitive gate applies to both voltage gated sodium channels and voltage gated potassium channels, okay? So let's review the molecular mechanisms. Um, a depolarization comes and this activation gate on the molecule opens. Pretty soon thereafter, there is an inactivating particle. So after this floods through a little bit, the inactivating particle blocks the channel, which starts to allow the membrane potential to be rebuilt. And then eventually the activation gate closes, which is a little bit slower process and then the membrane repolarizes. So if we take a look at the time course of action potentials, what's happening? So this is our characteristic action potential, um, change in membrane voltage. And we're gonna track here permeability or conductance, same thing, right? So it's the opening of the channels that allows the ions to conduct through. So we're following GNA and at first, so we have the channels open um, and the GNA will go towards the equilibrium potential of sodium. So that's the sodium activation or the opening of the sodium channels. But afterwards, uh, the, pretty soon, those sodium channels close, those gates close, but VM continues to go up even though GNA falls. And this happens once we cross threshold. That's because we also have the potassium channels, which are slower, opening a little bit later. And so when we have the activation of the potassium channels, we still have VM continuing to rise. Okay, and then as those channels close, then we have the falling of the membrane voltage again. It led to this beautiful idea called the Hodgkin cycle. So we have the opening of the sodium channels in the membrane, which causes the increased membrane permeability to sodium. That allows increased flow of sodium into the cell, just flooding into the cell, which is then going to cause depolarization and opening of the sodium channels in the neighboring proteins, causing the positive feedback cycle as the membrane voltage moves towards the chemical potential or the ENA. This is all following Ohm's law. Um, and those are the, the important parameters. Okay, so this is a positive feedback cycle that just bloop, 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 perpetuates down the axon like falling dominoes down the axon.
and um, it's being driven by the EMF or the electro electromotive force of sodium. So the driving force for the sodium to cross the membrane um, is this chemical potential. So it can cross when the channels are open because they are voltage sensitive gated channels. Okay, so our action potential review. The axon membrane has to start off polarized. We have to have high sodium on the outside, low sodium on the inside. These sodium channels have to be gated and voltage sensitive. They only open when a traveling action potential opens the neighboring sodium channels, allowing the sodium to rush in. It's, it is the existence of the sodium gradient that provides the chemical potential energy that's transferred to the electrical current. Again, we have a transfer between potential and kinetic energy. This action potential travels toward the chemical gradient, whatever chemical gradient exists, in sodium across the membrane. This action potential or high membrane voltage opens the neighboring voltage sensitive sodium ion channels. And it doesn't go backwards because it takes a while to reset this chemical potential on the membrane. It has to travel toward the unused sodium concentration. So here's this diagram of the directionality of the action potential. So it's going to travel, the impulse will travel in the direction of unused membrane potential. And then behind it, it, with a little bit of a delay, we have repolarization happening so that eventually the membrane is available to depolarize again. So this is our important player for why it doesn't all just get used up and run down and die. <laughs> because it's continually being regenerated by the sodium potassium antiporter, where three sodiums are sent to the outside and two potassiums are sent to the inside with the action of, with the consumption of ATP. So this is an active process, active transport. So obviously um, action, uh, neurons can't just fire continuously and repeatedly. When we have an action potential, there is something called an absolute refractory period where, where no matter how much you stimulate it more, there's just no further action potential generated. It is beating a dead horse. But after some time, um, you'll see that with a bigger stimulus, you can get a smaller action potential formed. So you need more current, more stimulus for reduced amplitude output. That's called the relative refractory period. When that period is over, the membrane potential is completely regenerated and then you can finally fire another action potential. So let's review. We have action potentials and graded potentials. Graded potentials produce our variable. So a variable amount of voltage change is proportional to the current that's applied. So it's sort of sensitive to the amount of stimulus and you get a different amount of voltage output. <clears throat> we can have depolarization where two sides of the membrane become more equally charged, or we can have hyperpolarization where two sides of the membrane become less equally charged. Of course, all of these responses are th sub-threshold. They do not elicit an all or none response. In contrast, when we're above threshold, we have an all or none or an action potential. 
So the membrane potential change above this threshold elicits a massive depolarization or action potential. And we can see um, <clears throat> lots of examples of graded responses at sensory receptors, which would be quite useful for measuring the strength of the stimulus, wouldn't it? Um, so we have graded potentials being collected. And then if we have enough stimulation, then only then will trigger an action potential which could send that signal a long way. Um, and you could even integrate it from many different sources and combine or subtract the signals in the central nervous system. So our sensory systems are often a series of graded um, and all or none responses. So sort of um, analog, digital, analog, digital, analog. So you wanna integrate information, but when you want it to go, you just want it to go. <laughs> um, and then you can have a series of relays here, which allow for a huge variety of complex behavioral responses. Okay, so I hope that was helpful and helps you understand a little bit about the nervous system. Take care.